The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, and thanks for joining us. My name is Deanna Helscher, and I'm the Regional Dean of the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin and the Director of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. Today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living, and our center's vision is healthy children in a healthy world. But we know you can't have healthy children unless you have healthy communities. And part of that is dealing with the current COVID pandemic. Before we get started, I just wanted to make some housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on our website at msdcenter.org. And we'll repeat that again at the end so that you can get that. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the questions chat box. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And we really like engaging with the audience. So feel free to list any questions that you have. So I'm very excited today to welcome back our speakers, uh, Dr. Joe McCormick and Dr. Sue Fisher-Hawk. So both of them are very experienced in epidemi epidemiologists and have done, uh, are, are internationally known for their work with uh, viruses. They also both co-authored a book uh, that several of y'all might have be, a, uh, be familiar with. It's Level 4 Virus Hunters of the CDC. So they've had a long and storied career, and they've talked several times about COVID, and now we're excited to have them talk about the different vaccines for COVID-19. And so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Drs. McCormick and Fisher-Hawk and have them start their presentation. So thank you very much, uh, Deanna. And uh, we're, as always, delighted to be here and to share our experiences uh, with, uh, with folks in the audience. Um, we uh, initially called this All You Want to Know About Vaccines uh, to uh, COVID-19. Uh, but in the interim, the vi virus variants have uh, started to emerge. And so we sort of gave a subtitle today, a vaccine versus variants, the battle rages because it's about how do we uh, outcompete the, vac the variants, the virus variants that are emerging uh, from the mutations, how do we outcompete those with vaccinations? And so uh, that's gonna be part of our theme, but we're gonna tell you more about uh, the vaccines. So if we can have the next slide. So the coronaviruses, it's a very large family of mRNA viruses, and then they are therefore uh, uh, part composed of a piece of, of nucleic acid that's sim very similar to stuff you have in your cells. However, what they've done is they've manipulated this so that they can now spread themselves widely among mammals. And they are a very, very large family. And the most of the, the hosts of these, of these viruses are often bat species and other wild species. One, but, you know, species we don't come in close contact with very often, but with overpopulation, we are now doing that, overpopulation of everybody everywhere. So about half of these have been isolated from bats, and these are called bat coronaviruses. Uh, the problem with the bats is the actual reservoirs are very large and highly mobile. And each, each bat species has got its own virus, its own bat coronaviruses. And we've seen these emerge from viruses a couple of times already in this century and for the first time. So 2003 saw the first outbreak in humans of a bat coronavirus. That was the original SARS. And this is a pretty severe respiratory disease with very high mortality, which in fact was a help because it allowed us to control it easily because we didn't miss any patients, there weren't any asymptomatic ones. 
Then we, another one was uh, isolated from the Middle East, and this one apparently came through camels. And this one was called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus. Next slide. Slide. Now the problem is that this has now really taken over in a large way with the pandemic that we're all very acutely aware of. And it's now become this COVID-19, which is the current uh, infection, was the third leading cause of death in the US. This one emerged in China uh, at the beginning of last year, or maybe the end of probably 2019, which is why it's called COVID-19. And it's due to a virus called SARS-CoV-2, to distinguish it from the original SARS virus. And it has shown an ability to spread and to cause absolute mayhem. Next slide. And here we go. So just to uh, point out that viruses mimic what our cells do. And viruses have been around a lot longer than we have as, as humans. So these viruses have developed over the years, and so we have DNA viruses that match our DNA in many ways. We have different RNA viruses, and this particular one is, as you see on the bottom of, our, of, the, of, the, uh, of the diagram here, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an mRNA vaccine uh, virus, which means it can get into a cell and make copies of itself uh, and put them back out uh, without even going into the nucleus. So it can be, it can, uh, can replicate very rapidly, can get into cells and replicate very rapidly. Next slide. And it does so by getting into, uh, into as I said, the, you see down at the bottom, the M mRNA uh, is made directly, uh, is copied directly and it makes what we call peptides that are part of the proteins, and that's how the spike protein gets made. Now I'll refer to the how cells make protein later because there's another type of vaccine which you know about, it's called Johnson and Johnson, and AstraZeneca use a little different strategy, but end up in the same place. The next slide. So the idea here is the, the RNA that encodes the spike protein, that's the protein that actually connects to the uh, re receptor on the cells, on the human cells, that allows the virus to get inside the cell. Um, and so making antibody to the spike protein is the target of, of, all, of virtually all the vaccines. Because when you block that spike protein with an antibody that covers it, the virus cannot get into the cell and it cannot replicate. So that is really the strategy of all of these different vaccines. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, they all seem to work very well. Next slide. So the spike protein gene for the, you've all heard of the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. So that one is actually the mRNA itself. Not the, not the DNA, but the mRNA that encodes the, virus, the spike protein is put inside of a, a lipid particles that protect it uh, and keep it uh, intact. And that's what is actually uh, makes up the, the actual vaccine. Um, next slide. The virus is missing. So the vaccine is just that piece of the virus, not the whole thing. The rest of the virus is missing out of this, so it doesn't uh, replicate. But the mRNA can get inside of cells when you vaccinate it, gets inside mainly of muscle cells, and it makes spike protein that go on the surface of those muscle cells. And those are seen by the immune system um, that, uh, that then starts to make antibody to it. So it's, a, it's quite rapid uh, in, in its uh, processing and the antibodies are, are starting to be made within five to seven days. Next slide. So now there's a separate group of vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca, and also uh, vaccines both uh, from uh, Russia and China that use a different method. They do the same thing, but in a different way. So they use what we call viral vectors, and these Vectors are DNA viruses that are called adenoviruses, 
many of them, they like a bit like the coronaviruses, they're spread out through uh, much of the uh, animal kingdom, particularly in mammals. Um, and there are human uh, de uh, human adenoviruses that are used uh, as these vectors to, and there the DNA of the spike protein, not the RNA, is put into the DNA of these uh, of these virus vectors. Now the vectors are engineered so they don't actually replicate, um, but they get inside of the cell nucleus. They make mRNA, which comes back out. Next slide. They're injected just like the other one, but they go into the cell, the adenoviruses goes into the cell, as you see from this cartoon, and then they dump their DNA into the cell nucleus. And what does a cell nucleus do? It makes, from the DNA copy, it makes mRNA, which comes back out just like the spike protein you saw for the uh, uh, for the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, it comes back out and the mRNA then starts to make a uh, spike protein, just like you saw with the uh, Moderna and Pfizer. It's just a different route, but the result is the same. Next slide. And what happens is you have a vaccinated cell, whether it's from the uh, from those uh, viral vectors or from the uh, Moderna uh, spike protein mRNA, doesn't matter. The proteins, the spike proteins go on the surface of these vaccinated cells. They're, they're seen by uh, what are called B cells and helper T cells of the immune system. And that's how the antibodies get made because the B cells start to make the antibodies to the spike proteins. And that's what then, that's how the, uh, the vaccines actually make antibody and protect us than from future infection. Next slide. Now, these are all the Moderna, the Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca are now what we call a full phase four application. That means they are being used to vaccinate the population. They've gone through the, the phases that, require, that are required for FDA approval, and now they are in phase four and of course, we're learning new things about them because millions, tens of millions of people are being vaccinated now uh, with, uh, with these. Now, there is another uh, uh, vaccine on the horizon made by a company called Novavax, which is yet again different. It's a pure protein vaccine uh, that's in phase three trials. We may or may not see that one emerge as a new vaccine. Next slide. So do you want to? This is uh, the cumulative incidence of, of um, I can't see. Very so well. uh, the, uh, this is a slide that shows you the incidence of what happens when you vaccinate people in the clinical trial. So this is from the phase three trial of the Pfizer vaccine. And you see that yellow uh, line that goes straight up there that is the people who got, uh, who got the placebo. That is, they got a, a dose of saline instead of the vaccine. And you can see that the uh, after weeks afterwards, the number of cases that have occurred in this group compared to the, the gray line at the bottom there, where you see after about uh, a week or 10 days after vaccine, there were literally no, almost no cases in the people who got the vaccine. And this is just a dramatic way to show you how effective the vaccine is, even after the first dose, and uh, even more so after the second dose. Next slide. So these simply show you that, uh, that whether we're talking about the, uh, the uh, prevention of infection, or to prevention of symptomatic COVID-19, which is the, the second one, the right hand top, or whether we're talking about hospitalization, which is the, uh, the curve on the left hand side on the bottom there, or severe COVID or even deaths. All of these represent the impact of the vaccine. And the red line shows you people who got the, uh, the placebo and the blue line shows you the people who got the vaccine. 
And in each one of them, you can see the, the, the blue line is much lower after a period of about 14 days after the second dose. The blue line is much low, lower, showing you again how effective these vaccines are against documented infection, symptomatic infection, or hospitalization, or severe disease, or uh, even death. So uh, all of these are prevented by these vaccines. Next slide. Now, sometimes you may wonder, well, how many cases actually occurred and how do you calculate these so-called 95% vaccine efficacy? Well, this, this shows you that the number of cases uh, at seven days after the second dose uh, in people without any evidence of infection um, shows you that there were eight cases in the people who got vaccinated out of 18,000 people who were vaccinated and there were 162 cases among another 18,000 people who got the, the placebo. And so that tells you that the overall efficacy, that 95% of the, of the uh, cases were prevented by the vaccine. So that's how this is, uh, this is calculated. Uh, and uh, just to show you, so you see the actual numbers that occur and what's used by the FDA and the drug companies uh, and the uh, monitoring people to actually decide whether the vaccine works or not. Next slide. You wanna talk about this one? So the actual use of the vaccine has been very successful. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is that the Pfizer and the Moderna have 94, 95% efficacy. That means that 94 or 95% of those people who have received the vaccine do not get severe disease and die. But a few people, that there's still 5% left out on the edge. And you've got to remember that we are seeing some breakthrough, so-called breakthrough infections in people being vaccinated. And what you're looking at is the 5%. You don't know who that 5% is going to be, but some people are still going to get infected. So we're starting, we've got a very good vaccine, so we're doing very well, but we're starting to see new problems. We see new problems every day, every week with this virus and with our, our campaign against it. And here are the vaccination rates in, in the US, and you see they're now just beginning to drop off. To begin with, there was a lot of enthusiasm and people over the age of 65 have been vaccinated, and we've reached about 75% of those people actually being protected. Or close to that. But now we're trying to vaccinate younger people. And then you have a lot of people who are hesitant about the vaccine and then another smaller group of people who for some reason, well, it's known to themselves, don't want it at all. But as a virologist, that to me is a very strange response. But anyway, there it is, that's what's happening. So we have a little bit of a problem there. But we are getting to the, the inflection point in vaccination in the US, where we now have enough vaccine uh, to meet demand. We need to get demand up and we now have enough vaccine to be able to share with developing countries, which is very important. Next slide. So vaccine distribution, even in the US, is good, but it's uneven. This particular map of, of New York City shows where the most of the vaccinations are and you will see it's this same old story the more wealthy areas are getting vaccinated much faster and much more widely than the poorer areas. So there is a lot of, uh, of um, not discrimination, but in unevenness in the distribution of the vaccine to poorer and to minority populations. Next slide. And we see this down in Brownsville. Maybe Dr. McCoy would like to describe these slides because it's, it's a project we've done recently. So we have, uh, over the last year, worked with our folks in Houston uh, who have a great deal of expertise in what's called spatial analysis. That is, look at making maps like this that help us to understand initially where were people getting tested back in the days when we needed information on testing and um, and uh, so now the same group uh, from uh, with our folks in Brownsville and, and Houston working together with the city health department 
and the county health department. So now our folks are able to make these maps. And what they show is the distribution of vaccine um, at, at the census block. So at the very granular level, we're now able to track uh, where vaccines are being uh, primarily delivered and the rate at which vaccines are being delivered. And, and this allows the, uh, this allows the, uh, the health department to go out and to focus on areas that we might call uh, vaccine deserts, where vaccines are not being applied at, at the level we would like. Next slide. So this uh, shows you also the maps of the cumulative cases between March and December. And that in a similar way, I probably should have shown this first, uh, in a similar way, this maps out where cases have occurred, but it also tells us where vaccines should be delivered because in those areas where cases have been the highest are undoubtedly the areas where vaccines meet, need to be delivered. So between the combination of these kinds of maps that are continuing to show us where cases are occurring and uh, overlaying the maps of vaccinations, we're able to target the vaccines uh, in a way that, uh, that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And particularly uh, in reference to the map of New York that uh, Dr. Fisherhock just mentioned, uh, these maps allow us to avoid that by trying to understand where have vaccines been given and where have they not been given and where do we need to go to try to improve the, uh, the vaccination levels. Next slide. Next slide. Now, the protection against infection is, is the next question with the vaccines. Do, are they uh, actually able to stop people getting infected? It does look, and you will see from this slide in that red box down there, that when you are, have fully vaccinated, you are far less likely to be actually infected than if you are not vaccinated, you're only partially vaccinated. The importance of this is that if you are infected and asymptomatic, you may be able to spread the virus. So what we're hoping is that we will be able to reduce transmission as well as illness and death with this vaccine. However, this is a little bit of a long shot because this is what's called hoping for a sterilizing vaccine. That is a vaccine that prevents any kind of infection. And in fact, that's a really very, very difficult to achieve. It depends on a lot of things, particularly on the individuals and their own immune response, their response to the vaccine, and how much vaccine dose they got. A lot of variables like that. So a few people are likely to be able to be infected may be mildly ill and may be able to transmit it, but generally the transmission is really cut dramatically by the vaccines. Next slide. So which brings us to the variants, because this is where the war starts. I'm going to talk about the battle now, because we've so far we've won the development and the vaccination battles pretty well. It's not perfect, but we're doing pretty well. But you never underestimate a virus. So the viruses are, in fact, evolution in fast time. If you don't believe in evolution, just watch a virus for a while. Because what it's doing is on a weekly, daily, even, or monthly basis, it's making little mistakes in its DNA. And what it does is it chooses out those mistakes that give it a, a, an advantage. It's more infectious or or otherwise is able to spread more easily. But we did a very, very bad job of this from the outset. We paid no attention to it at all. So the approach was pretty well sporadic and unplanned and depended mostly on scientific initiatives, certain scientists, and whether they had the resources to do this because it meant uh, viral sequencing, which is much easier than human genome, genome sequencing, but still requires a pretty large lab. And this is what happened in the USA, where, where discovery was, can only really be described as serendipitous. They, I'm thinking of the California strain, which just happened to be decided, uh, defined in December, because something had happened to have a lab which happened to have looked at it, and nobody else did anywhere else. So just why we have such limited information. 
There was only one symptomatic approach, and that was in the UK, and that's why the UK variant B117, we're now becoming familiar with, emerged in the UK and was detected. And the reason for this is because the Sinar Institute, funded by Wellcome in Cambridge, UK, decided at the outset, because they're virologists, the virologists collect everything they can, they collected all the strains. When they collected their strains, they said, what should we do with them? So they sequenced them. So eventually they began to detect some variants, but they didn't know what the importance of these was until September, when there was a cluster of cases in Kent, and they found these were all due to the B117. Next slide. So we went on from there pretty fast. So B117, and there are now several other variants I've outlined in red, the ones that as of uh, Tuesday morning at the end of April, these are the ones we're, we're actually looking at. But by Wednesday morning, we may have some new ones. Things are moving very, very fast indeed. And th these variants are emerging all over the place. The B117 mainly in the UK, um, and the South African strain and the Brazilian strain, who have more, I will show you in a moment, they have more mutations, are also spreading very widely. There's also a California strain, and there's some new strains emerging in, in, in India. Next slide, please. So, so just a comment here that this is a uh, this is the race that we're talking about. This is a statistical game. The more the virus replicates, the more likely it is to mutate. The more likely it is to mutate, the more likely it is to stumble on a new form of the virus that either escapes the immune system or is more infectious or both or causes more severe disease or all three. So that's the race that we're really talking about. So here is the B117. Uh, you may not be able to see this very clearly depending on your screen, but there are some little dots, I can't point to it, I haven't got a pointer here, on, on this spike protein. It's, it's a trimer, that means it's got three proteins which bind, bind themselves together into a single structure. And on the surface of that structure, there are certain epitopes, what they call epitopes, and these are what the antibodies antibodies see, what the immune system sees and tries to attack. And what the virus has done has changed the shape of these, and so they don't fit quite so well. So these, these changes on the B117 are, are not very big, in fact, but they're enough, in fact, to increase infectivity, it seems to be, that this particular spike can get into the cell more easily, and can rep, therefore the virus replicates more easily, and you get larger numbers of virus. Next slide. And then there's a B1351. This is the so-called South African strain. Now this one's gone a step further. It has the changes on the B117, but it's also got some other changes, which are what known as conformational changes. That is, they actually change the shape of the spike that your antibody sees. And it's a little bit more menacing because now there are two or three places where there may be a problem with fit to the antibody. Next one. And P1 had very similar changes. This is the one from Brazil, which is causing devastation in Brazil and has caused a really massive surge, or cataclysmic surge in Brazil, particularly in the big cities there. And this has the same mutations as the, the 135, uh, plus a few other little refinements that um, make the virus more viable, and all these variants are more infectious, as though we needed that, which we don't really. The virus has managed it. So many of you are also seeing what's happening in India, and apparently there is now at least one, if not more, uh, variants that are emerging in India that are, are, uh, are causing, in part, this massive uh, increase or surge in cases in India and deaths. Uh, we don't even know what that one looks like yet, or, or it's even its response uh, to vaccines. Next slide. So um, this is uh, data from a New England Journal of Medicine paper, which is really uh, pretty, really pretty elegant. So what they did, and this was in the Galveston lab, they uh, generated a series of, of, of potential mutants, not only the mutants we know about, but new movements that the virus might think of in the future. 
And they tested them against the antibody from people who had been vaccinated, by the vaccine, in fact. And you will see that not all those bars are the same height. The one on the extreme left, the blue one, is against the original strain. And you can see that some of the others neutralize pretty well and some not quite so well. But they're all above that dotted line. You see that dotted line towards the bottom? That's the dotted line which really provides protection. So even though these mutations have occurred, it looks as though the Pfizer vaccine, and I think the data are out there from Moderna as well, are able to neutralize these new variants, at least the ones you've got so far. So, so far, so good. That's good news. But it's at a, at a lower efficacy. So you won't have 95% any longer. It can make it up to 90% or even 85 But that's good because the, the Johnson & Johnson and the adenoviruses are around that level anyway. So that is a good efficacy, uh, even at 85% for a viral vaccine. So the 95% is really almost perfect, and we're really very excited to see it. And so those, those particularly those mRNA viruses are an enormous advance in, in viral science. And I think we all should be very, very grateful for such really good work and the fact that it's so safe. Next slide. I think there's a Nobel Prize coming up there or two. So, um, so could we go back to that other slide? I just want to make one point. Thank you. Um, so you can see the line there, and you see the number on the left that says 20, 40, 80, 160, and so forth. So the way this works is they take the serum, uh, that serum that comes from the blood of people who've been vaccinated uh, with these vaccines, and they make dilutions. So they make dilutions of one to ten, one in uh, one uh, drop in among ten drops of uh, of, uh, of water or saline. They make uh, another dilution that might be one in twenty, another that's one in forty, or one in eighty, and so forth. And they test those each. And as you can imagine, there are fewer uh, antibodies as you dilute this out. There are fewer antibodies. And what they want to know is, even if you dilute these out, do they still protect? So that's what these are illustrating. And it's, it tells you that there's still a fair cushion that we still have with these vaccines to prevent these, uh, these variants from spreading. So that's still, a, a, and that's again a, a, a measure of the race that we're in to try to get more people vaccinated and fewer uh, variants that emerge and that can spread. Next slide. So I want to talk about some of the complications and lack of complications for a moment. This is a, a, a slide showing the reactions of pregnant women to the vaccine and showing that they differ, they really do not differ noticeably from people who are not pregnant, from pregnant women and other people. So the side effects in pregnant women are definitely no different from in people who are not pregnant. Next slide. This is your complication slide. Yes, this is so a complication. It, yes, I'm sorry, I got one of the slides out of uh, out of order here. But this sort of takes us to a, another big issue about complications, which is the side effects from the AstraZeneca and the J and J vaccine. And what apparently is happening, as you heard earlier when Dr. McCormick described it, the adenovirus gets into the muscle cells and it puts its DNA in there. And in that DNA package, it also has the spike protein. So it makes the spike protein mRNA and, um, and uh, project, presents the antigen. That's all well and good. The problem is that the rest of the adenovirus is also in the cell. It's making a lot of other proteins. And we don't know what those are all doing. So in a very, very small number, mainly, mainly almost exclusively of younger women, um, there has been a very severe kind of autoimmune reaction to, um, to, a, uh, to, a, to, to a platelet protein, which is responsible for clotting. And this has produced a really rather drastic clotting disorder, which is also very, very unusual. 
because this clotting disorder has been recognized before following the use of heparin. Heparin is a very common drug used for uh, reducing clotting, believe it or not. And some people, for no reason at all, uh, that can be understood but actually react to it and develop antibodies to this, um, this uh, platelet, platelet factor for anion. And it causes the platelets to disappear. I think they're aggregating, so you get a big, a really disastrous complication of combination of clotting and bleeding. And the problem is some of this is in the brain. In the central venous uh, vein may clot or sometimes in the, in, the, in, the, in the gut, but the ones in the brain, including hemorrhage, have proved fatal in some cases. And this is what the side effects are all about and what we're worrying about. However, the actual incidence of this is one in a million. Now we're aware of it, we can, we can get some idea of predicting which people are more likely to get this and to take precautions. Uh, but the actual risk far outweighs the risk of the coronavirus. So I think the decision is made to continue to use these vaccines, but we have to be careful about this very, very hard clotting disorder. Next slide. So just let me make one comment before that. So the, the whole risk here is uh, lower, it is, is lower than getting hit by lightning. So that just tells you how incredibly low the risk is here. And as uh, Dr. Fisherhawk pointed out, the risk for severe or even fatal COVID infection is way higher than the risk of this complication. So there have been six of these cases seen in the United States out of something like seven or eight million back doses of vaccine of the Johnson & Johnson. So that's the reason that the decision was made by the CDC Review Committee to uh, continue the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the decision made in, in Europe to continue using the, the AstraZeneca because you can see the hospitals, uh, anybody who goes to the hospital with severe COVID has a much higher risk than getting this particular complication. I think the next slide, please. The next slide probably illustrates that. This is the uh, morbidity and mortality among pregnant women with and without COVID-19 infection. And what this shows quite clearly is there's very increased morbidity and actual mortality in pregnant women who get actual COVID infection. And they actually not only that, but next slide. If you look at the bottom there, that is the, is the fetal neonatal outcome, those two lines. And so you may lose, we are losing mothers and we are losing babies to these viruses. And so the recommendation now is that pregnant women should be vaccinated because this is the main risk. This is, this is the elephant in the room, not the ad that crawled across the floor. So I think we have to keep our perspective about the value of the vaccines and what it is we're trying to prevent with them and not become fearful about very rare side effects. Next uh, slide. Particularly this, there are a couple of other issues here. This coupled with the slide that, that, that uh, was shown earlier about the lack of complications when, when women who didn't know they were pregnant got vaccinated. In fact, they had no problem at all. They reacted just like everyone else. Uh, but the other thing that the vaccination of pregnancy does is provide several weeks of protection, antibody protection to the baby. Uh, so while the risk may be relatively low for babies, it's not zero. And as you can see here, uh, the risk of mother getting infected during pregnancy and losing the baby is much higher. Than or death the, to the mother. Or death to the mother is much higher, the risk there is much higher than anything that occurs from vaccination of, of the pregnant woman. These are data that came out in the last few days, which is why we're sort of very much, not very much an updating kind of talk. So the, the next slide. And this one shows what the real problems are becoming. We're now getting very worried about the long COVID syndrome. And it's more than the long COVID syndrome where people have a lot of anxiety, depression, fatigue, headaches, and body aches. That's bad enough. And it's common enough in, in about 30% of people to be an issue that the NIH is putting money into. But these data here follow up people who've been hospitalized or not hospitalized with COVID uh, 
19. And you can see there are positive people who are not uh, ill, hospitalized people who were ill, and ICU patients. And you won't be able to see very well on the right, but the blue line is much longer than any other line. And the red line is less long and the green line less long. And what is happening in these people is they're about more than 30 days out from having recovered from COVID. They have complications which bring them back into hospital on various and pretty well all the systems, respiratory, digestive, um, cardiovascular systems, and uh, they also have fatigue and, or, and anemia and a, and a whole range of disorders. We don't understand this. But it does suggest that this virus, which may be persistent in bats, may have an ability to persist in some form in humans. We don't understand this at all. It may be very occult, or it may be the result of disturbance of the immune system or a combination of the two. But it is definitely there and it's definitely real. And I think we're just beginning to pay a lot of attention to it because the numbers of people involved are really quite big. Next slide. So what else have we got to worry about? Well, the answer is plenty, because this is a virus which species jumps. So it came, goes from, we're talking about bats, camels, um, various kinds of animals, kind of humans, and the ability of the virus probably even to go back. So th this, the uh, adaptation, the mutations, allow the virus to jump from species to species. In the original species, they're often quite asymptomatic, but when they jump to a new species with an immune system that's never seen them before, all sorts of things happen, which is really what's happened to us in this pandemic. We have the consequences are really pretty well unknown once the virus shifts. Next slide. Yeah, this is a very interesting um, observation, and it's relatively recent um, that uh, now we're able to detect a virus in sewage, which means obviously it's being excreted in, um, in, into sewage by humans. And so this is allowing some, this is now being used in as surveillance in some of the uh, larger uh, populations. Uh, it was first observed in Italy, but now it's being used elsewhere to try to, uh, to use this as a surveillance tool to understand uh, what may be uh, circulating in the, uh, in the population. And particularly, you can, uh, you can uh, quantitate it to see whether there's an increase in the amount of a virus being excreted and whether that may uh, be an early marker for an increase, a surge in the population. So this is new technology, uh, but potentially very powerful to help us again, have other tools to monitor uh, infection as, uh, as it goes forward. It's, it's not a new technique at all because other viruses are trapped in sewages, particularly polio virus and other viruses. So next slide. So the variants, what are, what are they doing? I'm just giving you, these are different states in the year from the United States showing how with the uptick at the end, mainly right now in the Northeast, but we are fearful that it's going to spread to other parts of the US where the variants are going to give us new upticks. We don't know whether this is going to be a surge or what, but it is a matter of concern. Next slide. And this is what is really worrying us globally. Um, you can see there is a, a massive uptick globally, and it's mainly in countries outside the US that have not been fully vaccinated. Next slide. I think just a comment okay. before you move the slide. I think we all now understand, and uh, there is a, uh, obviously a global response now to try to help with what's happening in India. But we all understand that we're on the planet together and even if we uh, get control in one country, but we don't have control in the rest of the world, that we're all at risk for the new variants to emerge and for a, a repeat of the pandemic. So it's extremely important that we pay attention across the globe, not just uh, at our backyard. The next slide really illustrates this. So this is what's happened in India. 
And as you see at the top, yes, yeah, sure, there's the B117, but they've also got their own variants, which are coming out in the last couple of weeks. And you can see what it's actually done to the incidence of the viral infections. It's abs absolutely devastating. In a situation like that, where the virus is widely, widely spreading, you can be sure it's pushing out variants the whole time. And we don't know what those are going to be and when we're going to see one that's going to escape our vaccines completely. So it may be that we're going to need to reformulate our vaccines, boost our vaccines. We don't know, but a lot of attention is being paid to this. Next slide. And this is what it's doing in India. And there are pictures of the funeral powers as well, which is, is, is quite devastating. Next slide. This is, this is happening this week. Next slide. This to me is the most devastating of all, trying to get oxygen to patients in India. And even though India is a massive producer of oxygen, its failure to be able to distribute it, its failure of healthcare systems, failure of support systems, our failure to, in, to invest sufficiently in both public health and healthcare systems is coming back to bite us. Finish that last slide. So just to summarize very quickly, this is a bad virus. We can only encourage everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible uh, because you don't want to get this disease. Even if you recover, uh, you may have a long-term issue. We do have vaccines that are safe and effective, and they're currently effective against the variants. Uh, look, 200 million people have received at least one dose a vaccine in the United States, and the only deaths have been these one or two uh, rare events that occurred with the J and J vaccine. So we're talking about one or two deaths from vaccine in 200 million people, um, and so so protection is very solid. Um, they confer infection immunity at least in some to infection. Um, and certainly they are effective in preventing illness, in preventing hospitalization, and preventing death, and certainly in preventing the long haul syndrome. Uh, while distribution in the Western countries is doing well, those problems remain as you saw with the final slides there in, on India. So we are not nearly out of the woods as a, as a global population. Uh, and we have to address this globally because we know these viruses can mutate and, and spread. Vaccine access and hesitancies are now the biggest uh, impediment to getting global herd immunity. And in addition, the political inequality issues also have to be addressed if we are, are to get a fully vaccinated population. So with that, we'll stop and be happy to entertain questions. So thank you, Drs. McCormick and Fisher-Hawk. Uh, I thought that was one of the most clear explanations of vaccines that I've seen to date. So thank you for providing that for us. So as usual, we have a lot of questions for you. Uh, so I'm going to start with one uh, that uh, Christy Holt asked about two, pa two questions her patients often ask. So this is probably something others could ask as well. Number one, what were the instructions given to study participants regarding masking? And are there any data about masking or other basic public health measures taken by participants? I guess in the testing of the vaccines is what she's referring to there. So I'm, uh, the, the instructions were definitely to follow the, the public health guidelines. So they were, they were not told not to wear masks. They were told to wear masks, both the placebo and the vaccine people vaccinated. So the, the, there was equal use as far as we know. Now, I don't know whether they documented the use of masks, but of course, these are double blind studies. So people did not know whether they got the vaccine or whether they got the placebo, nor did the people who were doing the vaccinating. And the second part of that question is, patients want a more definitive answer to why some people have vaccine side effects and others do not. 
Does it relate to a previous infection having a robust immune system? Uh, observational data show some with prior infection having strong response to first dose. Is this purely anecdotal? But the problem is what the, we have a word for it in medicine. It's called idiosyncratic, which basically means we have no idea. <laughs> so, so, well, we do know that in principle, if you have a bit more reaction, now, let's be clear, none of these reactions are life-threatening. We're talking about whether you get a sore arm, almost everybody gets a sore arm. Um, we're talking about whether you feel bad, and may, particularly after the second dose, and we have all ascribed that, uh, I think rightfully, to the fact that um, a, a strong immune response, and we know that's true with production of cytokines and other things that cause us muscle aches and fever, so a few people, some people will get more reaction than others. Uh, the basis for that is, as uh, Dr. Fisherhawk said, is unclear. Well, we, we, we don't know what it means. We do know that for sure, none of these vaccines will give you COVID-19 because they do not contain the genetic material of the vaccine that can actually cause an infection in you. All it does is prime your immune system. So they're quite safe. But I think the other big, big thing to remember is a year ago, we knew a fraction of this, and we still only know a fraction of what we need to know. So it was, as I said with some of the slides, look, I updated this last week, I updated it yesterday. That, that's the pace at which our knowledge is going. So ask me again in a year, I might be able to tell you. I totally agree. I think people forget how little we knew last year at this time. Uh, it's been ex exponential, the amount of knowledge on this. So another question, and y'all touched on this uh, briefly, is what is the status on development of vaccine booster shots? Will they be needed? So the vaccine companies are paying a lot of attention to this. The question would be, what kind of booster are we talking about? My, my bias would be that it would be a booster that includes a number of different, the mRNAs for a number of different variants, because that's entirely possible with this. You don't have to do only one uh, variant. You could make uh, mRNA to several of the variants uh, included in one, one uh, vaccine. Now, whether there are any gonna be any FDA uh, requirements for that is not clear. But typically, when you've already got a vaccine that works, all you have to do is to show that anything that's new is equivalent in terms of its immune response and in terms of its safety. So that's a very different kind of, of, of test, much faster, much easier uh, than a whole new uh, efficacy trial, which is what takes the time. But I think the other thing to remember is another enormous advantage of this mRNA technology which is totally revolutionary, we have to understand that. It's not new, but it is revolutionary. It's been around for about 20, 30 years, been used for cancer, but applying it to vaccines is a total revolution. Is that when you actually design, make your vaccine, it's a bit like having a, a computer program where you just program in what you want the vaccine to look like and the machine does the rest. So this then allows them to make a variant vaccines using exactly the same technology very quickly and easily. With the adenovirus, it's more complicated. You've got to make the stuff and you've got to put it into the adenovirus, you've got to grow the adenovirus up. So it's much more laborious, but the mRNAs have this extraordinary flexibility. So I think we can be pretty confident that the industry can respond to this and respond pretty well. Great. We just so, got to keep ahead of the virus. <laughs> So uh, this is a good question. Ha any suggestion on how to respond to vaccine hesitant folks who worry about long-term effects of the vaccine? Well, I think that trying to contrast the risk there, which is practically zero out of 200 million people compared to the risk of COVID itself, uh, both getting COVID and, uh, and particularly if you're at high risk, and it doesn't mean you have to be old. You, there are now, it's now evident that younger people are getting this disease, getting hospitalized and dying. 
So the risk of that is way higher than any kind of side effects from the vaccine. And it's and not about yourself. It's about the other people you're going to give it to. I think that, you know, it, we, we, we sort of tend to think, oh, is it right for me? Is it right for me? Is it right for the rest of society? Are you going to infect other people when they're going to die? That's, the, that's really uh, an argument that might work with some people. Yeah, I think that those are good points. Uh, you know, it's interesting when people think of their own individual susceptibility to that. Uh, but when we're talking about lots of people and those trucks of oxygen, because there's so many people involved, that's quite a different story. So a uh, question here, why do we know why COVID-19 cases or deaths are so low in Africa compared to the rest of the world. When y'all showed that diagram, Africa was very low. Well, are y'all worried that that will increase? Well, uh, I think, so I've spent uh, a good, I've spent five years living in various parts of Africa and many other years, uh, times working in many countries in Africa. And I can assure you that the surveillance there is nowhere near good enough to report the kind of, make the kind of reports. And secondly, uh, and particularly if you go out into rural areas. Now, uh, transportation is not as wide in some parts of Africa. So there may be rural areas that are more spared, but they're also difficult to get to and you wouldn't know whether there was an outbreak going on there or not. So I think, and testing is also another issue. This depends on testing. The reporting depends on testing. And uh, the testing there is extremely low. So I don't think that we should assume that, uh, that Africa is going to escape in that sense. Now, there are many things that we don't know, and that is there may be whole areas of, of people who have been in contact with the coronaviruses that might provide some protection that we don't even know about. So I think the jury is still out in terms of understanding what's going on in Africa, but I wouldn't assume that that just on the face of that graph, that it means that there are not many cases. What's Clearly, there are plenty of cases in the cities like, like South Africa, for example. But what is clear is that underreporting is, is, is probably massive. And um, underreporting, despite that graph from India, there's massive underreporting. The people who are out there are telling us that a lot of people are dying at home, never getting tested. Those cases never find themselves into the data. So we've gone to reporting here in the US, but when you get to countries like that with very large populations and very limited resources, you get massive underreporting. Great. So we have several questions about pregnant women and breastfeeding and the vaccine. So one is, is there a better time in terms of trimester to get vaccinated to give more antibodies to the baby after birth? So typically in these trials, if a woman knew she was pregnant because they didn't want to include pregnant women, they did not include them. So almost all of the people that you saw in that study that were vaccinated when they were pregnant did not know they were pregnant. And uh, therefore, it tells us that early on, vaccination early on had virtually no effect on the mother or the child, but it certainly would have given mother uh, antibodies to pass on to her child in the uterus, as well as having antibodies to pass on to the child at breast milk. So I think that there is currently the evidence says you can get vaccinated almost any time in pregnancy and not have to worry about side effects, but it will give your child. Now, if you get vaccinated in the third trimester, maybe because we don't know that much about how long the antibodies last, they clearly last at least six months, probably much longer. Um, that's just all the data we have. Doesn't mean that's all they last. So it, it certainly will be, uh, I think, have uh, an effect on breast milk no matter when you get vaccinated. I do think that it's very, that as pregnancy progresses, the risk gets greater of maternal and fetal complications. And therefore, the oh, further, from, COVID. from COVID, so the further you go, go forward with, your, with the, the pregnancy, the more important it is to get vaccinated. 
But our, uh, we give a lot of vaccines in pregnancy anyway. We give the, the uh, tetanus vaccine. And uh, so it, it's not unprecedented to vaccinate pregnant women. And we don't know of any side effects in pregnant women that would suggest there's any contraindication. So uh, I would suggest you know anybody who's pregnant should try and get the vaccine as soon as they possibly can, because the best vaccine is the one you can get quickly. And uh, we still have a lot of questions here, but it's time for us to wrap up. So. Uh, thank you again. It's amazing how quickly that hour goes by and with the questions too. So we have some additional questions there and we will post some answers to those uh, later for those of you that are on the <coughs> recording. I just wanted to uh, let you know that we appreciate all of y'all being here. We especially uh, appreciate Drs. McCormick and Fisher Hawk for putting this presentation together and sharing it with all of us. Uh, we really appreciate all the work that goes into this and your willingness to share your knowledge with all of us. And then again, we just want to remind you that this webinar will be archived at msdcenter.org. So feel free to go there and access the recording, uh, send it out via social media or to other people that you think would benefit from this information. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.